so the first thing really I want to say is that um, international society have been have seen both periods of conflict and peace. Um, if you look beyond World War I and World War II and in between, there is a big possibility for peace. In fact, um, you'd see uh, the Cold War, uh, which is not really a war. So, um, but you know, there was threats of conflict. Um, so, and in between conflict, there is the possibility of cooperation. Um, however, many scholars of international relations uh, predict that power transitions, such as what we're experiencing today, and global shifts are, uh, tend to be violent and therefore decreasing the chances for global solidarity on important issues. We know that the biggest threat of humankind is the COVID-19 pandemic, and we need to be able to cooperate in those aspects more than ever. Global public health is such an important topic. Vaccines, the, the provision of vaccines towards more vulnerable peoples, that's, that's definitely one of the things that we have to solve today. Um, we're not even talking about the environment, where we also have to talk about international trade and essentially uh, cultural understanding um, and you know, ethnic understanding uh, and religious understanding among countries. And we know that different countries have you know, different priorities and interests. So the question is, despite those competing interests, competing visions for the world, is it possible for peace and solidarity to occur, right? Um, and uh, in the field of international relations, there's a big group of scholars who say that it's not possible um, and that transitions will always, always be, um, you know, uh, very conflictual. One of those theories that, that um, deny the, the possibility for peace is realism. Um, realism in international relations theory, um, you know, in contemporary parlance or, or in, in, uh, in a basic parlance, in, in popular parlance, you could call it um, Machiavellian. But really, there's really a lot of um, theoretical assumptions to realism in IR. In fact, um, they made it scientific by creating a, a uh, looking for enduring facts in the international relations. And that's the enduring facts in international relations. Fact, the most important, is what you call anarchy. Um, for some, anarchy is, is, uh, is, uh, definitely leads to, to conflict and it is akin to conflict. But for some theorists, anarchy is simply the absence of world government. By that, we mean that the international system is quite different from the domestic system where you have the courts, you have the police, you have the army to look um, to if there's any conflict between parties or among parties. In the international realm, you do not have that, despite having the United Nations, right? And so that brings fear and insecurity among countries. Um, so the argument is that because of this fear and insecurity, because you have no one to turn to, declining powers will resort to conflict. Um, and then rising powers will challenge them uh, using their own alliances or using their own uh, power, uh, material power. Um, the, in, the, the argument further says that the international system and the fundamental characteristic of states, not just the system, but the states themselves, uh, you know, are, are always conflictual. And uh, as, as I said, the assumption here uh, is that anarchy inherently pushes states towards conflictual relations instead of cooperation and solidarity. So, you know, for, for, for uh, but obviously many theories disagree with this. Uh, and I'm going to discuss uh, here the philosophical basis for why they disagree with the realist vision of conflict in, in international transitions, right? Uh, but what I want to say is that this prediction, even among policymakers and among uh, people observing China and observing uh, the U.S. and how it will act, observing Russia, observing uh, countries that are getting more power through uh, economic growth and all of these things, the 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 this prediction uh, is based on a set of theoretical orthodoxy in international relations theory, um, which also mirror the way social science theory has developed over time. So the bid for IR theory to be scientific pushes IR theory closer to physics, closer to economics. By that, uh, uh, meaning that the, the, the um, 
the the need is for a, a good theory will mean that you find eternal loss in society. And IR theory found, uh, at least have argued over the last few decades, that the eternal loss are conflictual. Uh, the, the loss that you find in international society is conflictual. Um, so we're going to present an alternative view by looking at several sets of um, assumptions. Um, by that, we mean that we will engage uh, uh, the philosophy of the social sciences at the level of ontology. The argument is that these predictions are overstated. Uh, conflict is overstated. If, if you look at a bigger stretch of history, even in East Asia, um, in fact, there's a, big, um, there's a big research group that suggests that, in fact, China does not conform to Western standards of conflict. Uh, in that during the, the earlier centuries, China has actually cooperated even at the time that it was the most powerful country in East Asia. So conventional wisdom really challenges, challenges this um, evidence. Later, I'm going to present some evidence as well. So what we're saying is that um, uh, the orthodoxy is based on several uh, social forces or social assum assumptions of what the dominant social forces are. The first assumption is individualism that um, all states are individualists, that relationships don't matter, that, that uh, communities don't matter, and that states will always think about themselves in a very egotistical way. So that's the assumption of theory. The second assumption, ontological assumption, is materialism, that countries are simply motivated by uh, the pursuit of material gains. And the pursuit of material gains usually come in the form of money, economic growth, that's why it's such a big issue that China is getting uh, more economic uh, benefits in the international system. So that's a big issue because the assumption is as they get more, as countries get more, they will be more conflictual and the world will be more conflictual. So that's why there's a lot of that. even the news, Bloomberg. I mean, there's a whole industry about this whole uh, prediction that China will be violent, right? And the third assumption is, the, is a world, a paradigm of the world um, where conflict of interests cannot be resolved um, and that conflict is inherent in social relations. The argument is that society is much more complex than these three assumptions. Assumption of individualism, the assumption of materialism, and the assumption of a conflictual world. Um, so, but international relations theory and social science theory rarely engage with the philosophy of the social sciences at the level of ontology. And because of that, what you have is institutionalized orthodoxy in the academia, right? That, 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 uh, that uh, 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 discriminates other types of philosophies and favors uh, these three um, um, ideas, especially in IR theory. So the dominant, the dominant uh, theory is realism in IR theory. Um, and we reviewed this current, uh, earlier, it's about anarchy and conflict and the decentralized nature of power lead countries to be individualistic. By that, we mean, again, that there's no uh, uh, bigger government uh, in the world and that because of this different structure that you can find in the world compared with the domestic sphere, um, automatically things are going to be conflictual. Rationality and individualism is defined materially. And uh, later I will discuss the difference between absolute and relative gains. And power is defined materially. Um, therefore, uh, definitions of power such as prestige and status in the world really doesn't matter. It's really about the pursuit of guns. It's really the pursuit of uh, more land and geography and more money. Um, and uh, states themselves act like human nature. So, so the assumption is that humans are inherently conflictual which they're not. So are states inherently aggressive? What do states really want? What are their interests? What are the sources of these interests, right? The, the assumption of realism is more often than not, it's conflictual because of all of these reasons. Um, so before we engage in the level of philosophy, we know that uh, China's rise uh, presents really one of the most important global shifts in the world. For some, it represents the, the, um, the, uh, 
uh, increase of power of Asians um, and that China is leading the way. Uh, but at the same time, some really just view China's uh, rise as a challenge to US dominance or Western dominance. Uh, so there are, many, there are many scholars who focus on US-China relations. And there's a big debate about whether China is what you call a status quo or a revisionist power. So it's, it's, a, it's a, well, whether China will work with the current norms, with the current institutions, or will China want to remake the world um, and therefore, if there's a global shift, then, then it will challenge the norms, norms of democracy, norms of sovereignty, norms of um, uh, respect for human rights and trade, then, you know, there might be some issues because the U.S. will not be willing to give up those norms. Um, and so uh, a lot of the people focusing on China are offensive realists. Okay? So there are many types of realisms, but the dominant is offensive realism among many looking at um, China's international relations. So you're talking about scholars such as John Mersheimer and many other scholars um, who focus on conflict. Um, and the China's rise was nurtured by great power competition. There's always competition in the US and Soviet Union, both of whom were seeking hegemony in the international system. So the question is, do countries always want to get hegemony? Hegemony means the dominance in the world. Um, and um, uh, because Europe and the U.S. Uh, uh, has always had that goal, especially in, in the 19th century and 18th century, they're assuming that China will be the same, right? So a lot of international relations theory are also based on Western history and not really based on history that really happened in China. And there are a lot of scholars who are saying that if you really look at the history of East Asian international relations, you would see quite different dynamics, uh, uh, something that you will not find in the Western world. Okay, so why engage the philosophy of social science? So ontology also, um, so it's because uh, society is much more complex than simplistic assumptions of conflict, individualism and materialism. And we need to be able to acknowledge and synthesize all these social forces and discuss all these social forces to be able to create or be to have a more informed theorizing as we talk about the world, as we talk about conflict. The more that we talk about conflict, the more that conflict will happen. So is there an alternative to conflict? Is it possible? The answer is yes. Um, but also we, when we think about the philosophy and social science at the level of ontology, it also allows for a fundamental understanding of social reality. Um, uh, there are many types of uh, ontologies in the social sciences, but I would say that there are just a couple, actually just 11 um, ontologies in the social sciences that define the different uh, fault lines among theories, right? But what I'd focus on are just several. So the first one are interests. So what type of gains do countries really want, right? Um, so do they want relative or absolute gains? Um, and I will explain that later. Do they, are, are, is the world uh, uh, um, power, is it made up of materialism and ideationism? Um, is there a, a, a preference for conflict or is it possible for harmony, for a harmony paradigm to exist? And is the world static and evolutionary? And I'd wanna focus on this as well, because if we assume uh, and concede that the world is somehow conflictual, can it change towards something more peaceful? If you assume that, 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 um, that the world is static, then it cannot change. We cannot do anything about it. But there's a, another perspective, which is an evolutionary perspective, that even if you can see that there's conflict, it's quite possible to have peace in the future. As long as you, you know, individuals, universities, policymakers work towards that. And therefore that's, that creates less pessimism uh, in the world as we practice solidarity and all of these possibilities in the world. Yeah. Um, so in terms of interests, our countries, in, in terms of relative gains, our countries only concerned about gaining more than other states or are states concerned about gaining something uh, from another state, right? So um, the difference is crucial because if, you, if a state always wants relative gains, the state will always wanna get more and therefore cooperation will not, 
is very very uh, uh, impossible. Like it's 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 um, there's a, a lesser possibility for cooperation and peace. But if we describe states to just want to have something, not necessarily greater than other state, then it's possible to cooperate in many areas such as trade. So even if the 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 um, the gain is lopsided towards another country, but the other country is just willing to get something. That's what you call absolute gains. It's possible to get uh, peace, peaceful relations and cooperation. Uh, but a lot of scholars think that China wants relative gains. A lot of countries who emerge uh, in the world will want relative gains. And in fact, uh, the reason why they want to emerge in the world in the first place is because of the pursuit for relative gains. But the alternative view is that actually that's not really accurate and countries want absolute gains. Um, and that they, they just wanna get something because it will benefit them regardless of whether um, they will get more or less from a specific deal. Um, so just think about trade relations. If in fact, one of the, the biggest issues for creating the mega trade deal called the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is because um, some countries get more such as um, in some industries than, than other countries. And that's why they wanted to negotiate for better deals. But actually not all countries wanted more from the certain deal. They just wanna be included um, in that deal. So what we're, what we're seeing is the alternative view is absolute gains is what countries want. And if we assume this, it's possible for countries to cooperate and possible for countries to have peaceful relations. The second set of, um, of uh, ontological assumptions about the world is uh, materialism and idealism. So the argument of materialists is that state behavior is determined primarily by material motivations. So that means that if, if a certain country will invade another country, um, it, it's, it's really about the pursuit for more growth, for more guns, for, for more material benefits. Um, but the other view is, is ideational. That means that state behavior is determined primarily by norms, by beliefs, by, uh, by, um, uh, uh, by uh, ideas, um, by culture. If countries are motivated not just by materialism, but also by ideationalism, it's quite possible for a country to pursue a norm of peace rather than always just getting material things. Just look at the, the um, after World War II, uh, we know that Japan deinstitutionalized war in their constitution. So what they did was they, 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 they promised to the world that they're not going to attack another country. Um, and you know, uh, if, 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 if it's gonna pursue this, it's gonna be the last resort. So, if we assume that ideationalism is also a motivation of states, not just materialism, then there's a possibility for peace. Um, so if uh, certain ideas such as uh, uh, non-interference or ideas of, such as nuclear non-proliferation exist in the world and exist in countries, then there's a possibility for peace than just the pursuit of material needs. So this is quite crucial as well. If we admit that uh, peaceful ideas can be a motivation for countries, then solidarity is a problem. It, is, it won't be a problem. Uh, solidarity is a possibility. And I think this is, a, this is also one of the most important, um, the harmony paradigm and conflict paradigm. A lot of economists actually uh, assume for the harmony paradigm, uh, but some theorists such as Marxist theory, such as uh, realist theory um, and many, many other theories um, assume for the conf assume conflict paradigm to be the dominant paradigm in the world. So maybe just break that, break that down one by one. The conflict paradigm assumes that agents often have conflict of interest because of the pursuit for relative gains. And agents res often resort to actual conflict. They don't wanna resolve it. Uh, they resort to actual conflict because of the conflict of interest. And most social outcomes are determined by agents' conflictual behavior. So there are a lot of theories uh, that, that um, 
that assume this. Uh, in, the, in this slide, you can see offensive realism that assumes that the world is really a product of conflict, Marxism, that the world will be a product of conflict among classes. But at the same time, you have uh, the harmony paradigm uh, where there's generally more common interests. Um, and if there's a conflict of interest, that it's possible to resolve this conflict of interest. Um, and that most social outcomes are produced by cooperative behavior instead of um, conflict. So you would see that in theories such as economics, where relationships are really based on economic transactions, and uh, there's really less room for conflict in that sense. Another branch of realism, such as defensive realism, and that's the, the way we will want to describe China as a defensive realist, believe that even if there's um, conflict of interest, it does not necessarily lead to conflictual relations, right? And therefore, there's a possibility for solidarity. Finally, the last uh, ontological uh, set of ontological assumptions is that uh, that of static versus evolutionary perspective. Uh, as I said earlier, this is important because if we describe the world to be static, and if we describe it to be conflictual and static at the same time, then there's no room for change. Um, and international systems will always be like that. And therefore, states will act accordingly. If the world is conflictual, the states will react with fear and uncertainty. And uh, therefore, they won't change. But if we admit for the possibility of evolution, that international systems and countries evolve uh, from being belligerent to being peaceful, or actually from peaceful to belligerents, um, then there will always be a possibility for peace and cooperation if we take the evolutionary leap of the world. Um, so all these sets of ontological assumptions are rarely discussed in open uh, at the level of theory uh, because a lot of social scientists are not very um, comfortable with the level of, or with discussing philosophy, but the the argument should always be that we should engage the philosophy of social sciences, look at the orthodoxies, look at the ontological assumptions and theories that we make, because it's very, very important, right? Um, proper theorizing will, will, be, will only, only be borne out if we look at uh, philosophy of social sciences. And we will be able to understand theories better if we look at philosophy of the social sciences. And so there are a lot of scholars, maybe just zeroing in China, because China is a good example or case study to analyze these ontological assumptions. So there are a lot of countries saying, uh, scholars saying that China is a satisfied country. But at the same time, a lot of scholars saying that China is a dissatisfied country, and therefore it will want to revise the world order and will, will want to pursue relative gains rather than absolute gains, will, will want to pursue uh, conflictual relations rather, rather than cooperation. Um, and you know, we, we don't blame them because there's a lot of theories that really do not unpack at the level of philosophy. Um, but what we're saying is that China is a, it's a realist state, but it's, it's a defensive realist state. By that, we mean that states do not intentionally reduce the security of other states. And it's only there, uh, uh, its actions are based on not offensive intentions, but defensive intentions. It wants to really just defend itself. Um, conflicts can be resolved and overcome by cooperation. Conflicts, therefore, are not necessarily part of international politics. It's not an enduring part of international politics. Um, and there's a lot of Chinese philosophy, actually, that, that, um, that predict that China will be more peaceful than what uh, people uh, actually think. So we also see the evolution of Chinese foreign policy over time. Um, China has moved from an offensive realist state, from Mao Zedong wanting to overthrow the international system to interject its own vision of the world, to a defensive realist state and even a liberal state under Deng Xiaoping. And the assumption is that under Deng Xiaoping, it wanted to cooperate with the ASEAN countries. It wanted to be part of the world. Obviously, we know the great opening up of China under Deng Xiaoping to, towards the liberal and capitalist and, um, system. And even obviously when you open up the liberal ideology, ideologies for uh, alternative views rather than just Chinese worldviews, 
will also be learned um, by China and, and its policymakers. So you'd see this evolution. In fact, since 1949, um, 1949 is a watershed moment for China because it was the, the time that um, um, the Communist Party of China took over from the Chinese Republican state. So China has participated in 23 unique territorial disputes with on neighbors with its neighbors in land and at sea. But the striking uh, empirical evidence is that China has pursued compromise and offered concessions in 17 of these conflicts. So out of 23 land and sea conflicts, China has has conceded 17. So that's a almost uh, 70 to 80 percent of of all territory territorial disputes over the last few years. So what explains that? If everything is about conflict, if the West um, believes that everything is about conflict, that they will be motivated by conflictual relations, what explains this empirical evidence? So in the face of this empirical evidence, we really have to extend our worldview towards other ontologies, other uh, theoretical um, uh, traditions that, that, that admit the role for peace in the world. Um, so maybe this is just a rundown of all the, the evidence, uh, the disputes that China has gone through over the last few years. Um, so you have um, issues with Burma, with Myanmar, with North Vietnam, with Nepal, with India uh, across its border. Uh, even North Korea is in, in the Chinese border as well. Issues with Mongolia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Soviet Union, Laos, Bhutan, and Vietnam. So um, there are a lot of settlements as well um, with these countries. Uh, that we also see uh, issues with Kazakhstan, um, Tajikistan, the former USSR countries. There's some violence, but there's at, at the at at, um, at the end point of of such um, issues were uh, concessions. In fact, uh, increasing trade relations, increasing diplomatic actions, um, you know, uh, uh, cooperative actions among these countries, and a lot of compromises and concessions have been made by China. So why is it that that um, even if you look back in history, uh, at the time that the East Asian countries uh, had a tributary system, China has actually been very cooperative. Um, and uh, it did not subjugate and colonize other countries. So China has never colonized any country in the world. At the time when Europe was in a colonization spree, um, China did not do that, even if it, it was really powerful. So there's a diff different worldview that China has. In fact, it could be argued that China was even more powerful than Europe at the time that Europe was colonizing. So if the, the, the orthodoxy is that powerful countries will always seek to subjugate weaker countries. Why is it that China did not do that? It's quite fascinating evidence, really. Um, and we're, we're not really speaking about um, defending China and its actions, but it's really about the evidence and perhaps admitting that there might be a different worldview and a better future for, for the whole world. Um, and so, what happened was that um, under uh, uh, Mao Zedong, the offensive realist uh, theory of Mao Zedong, uh, state under China, uh, Mao, uh, the offensive realist Chinese state under Mao Zedong, what they had was um, they, they expounded a, an ideology of overthrowing imperialist regimes in Asia and the world by supporting insurgencies and imperialist and, and, uh, and uh, threatening the sympathetic, the people sympathetic to the West. Mao also believed that conflicts were inevitable and a necessary part to transform the world into socialism. Cooperation was negligible. Um, it also believes that the intentions of other states are evil. and That's the world uh, will always be conflict prone. That's under Mao Zedong, but China has evolved um, to a defensive realist state under Deng Xiaoping. And what it did was China expunged its revolutionary actions and rhetoric. It opened up to the world. It welcomed foreign investments and ideas that are different from its own. And Deng Xiaoping realized that how other states react to them is a product of their own actions towards the states, right? So, so, uh, 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 so that means that it has to be careful with uh, how, how it, it um, deals with other states. And it's also practice self-restraint. 
uh, by being a member of international institutions. It's been a, a, a supporter of the ASEAN, the ASEAN Regional Forum, where the South China Sea and West Philippine Sea disputes are being discussed. Um, and in, 19, in 2001, it, was, it, was, um, it, uh, it became part of the World Trade Organization. The, the, the leading trade organization in, in the world that really discusses or um, regulates the, the or encourages free market in the world. So that's such a big thing because it means that China is willing to subject itself to rules that have been created by other countries before it. Um, and as we have seen, uh, China has also resolved many of its territorial conflicts amicably. It has pursued cooperation through um, the Belt and Road Initiative, which seeks to reassure other countries as well um, that it, it seeks to cooperate with them. And uh, many other institutions, AIB, the ASEAN Plus Three, it has become a champion of economic globalization. Xi Jinping has in fact spoken about economic globalization. And it's willing to pursue talks and cooperate instead of just you know, shunning talks and shunning um, cooperative um, uh, uh, opportunities uh, with other countries. So maybe just to sum it all up, if you look at social science theory and international relations theory from a different ontological perspective, we may find that there's, there's more possibility for cooperation and peace than has dominantly been argued by a lot of, uh, by, in, by the media and a, a lot of scholars as well who have a, a, an offensive realist vision. But we're saying that those visions are based on really just three sets of ontological assumptions that may be limiting to, to um, um, and may not be enough to really accurately describe the world and predict what's going to happen in the future. So the case of China, uh, the most dominant emerging country in the world, tells us that it's possible to evolve. The international system can evolve, countries can evolve, and there's a huge potential for cooperative relationships in the current world order. So maybe to end, I'd say there is a big possibility for solidarity. There's a big possibility for peace and cooperation. Countries and organizations, universities, professors can work towards that as long as we admit that the world is not always conflictual, that people and countries are not always materialistic and individualistic. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I hope for uh, a fruitful discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Garcia. That, that lecture was really enlightening and, uh, and, and filled me with the hope. <laughs> Earlier I was talking about the hopes for, for solidarity getting higher with this. It really has, uh, it's really now uh, beyond uh, bounds. Anyway, so it's uh, just reassuring uh, to know that um, despite the so many problems that we have been seeing around us, you know, hopelessness, uh, are we going to be united at all? Are we going to have solidarity? So here, here's a here's a different and altogether different reading of what uh, of what uh, what's happening around us in this particular region. Now, so that lecture did not disappoint us. No? Our hopes. And expectations about solving the solidarity crisis have become even stronger. But you see, admittedly, we um, we were all anxious and, and wary about power changes or uh, shifts in hegemony, especially in this, uh, especially if it happens right at our doorstep, right? So, but the lecture has just uh, made us see that despite our initial fears, there's actually hope for it, and a lot. I mean, it's well founded based on what has happened in history, right? All we need to do is to look at it from a different view and then uh, there. So we have an altogether different uh, way of looking at reality. But of course, we'll have maybe like later in the Q&A, uh, yeah, right now, in a few minutes, in a few seconds, we can ask for maybe further clarifications on, um, I mean, just uh, take note of it, Dr. Garcia, uh, maybe some other elements that can assure us that, uh, okay, it's such a view can really be a reality. You know? In addition to um, maybe the four elements or the four debate um, issues that you have mentioned, what other elements can should there be in order for solidarity to really, to really uh, uh, be obtained? Now, for example, in the other um, uh, session that I, I, I was this morning, somebody highlighted and they're all, they all agreed that uh, trust is very important for any relationship, for any solidarity to happen then uh, trust has to be 
there. Uh, okay, so let's reserve that for the Q and A. And uh, and uh, but before we proceed to the question and answer portion, there are just some rules that the that the organizers want me to read out now for I mean better conduct of the Q and A. So let me go through this now. Uh, there are just six simple questions, not really um, um, not not really new. I mean everybody knows this, but uh, let me just uh, read this out just the same. Uh, first, if there are questions mentioning specific cases, there might be. The names of persons involved and the place where these cases happen shall not be mentioned. Second, questions on sensitive topics that can potentially offend specific groups of people based on religion, ethnicity, etc., are not permitted. Third, questions that are irrelevant, of course, relevant to the topics under discussion are not allowed. And then questions have to be formulated in clear, straightforward manner. I mean, we can rephrase it you know, so that uh, it's simple and understood by everybody. And the moderate, moderator, that's me, I have the right and authority to stop the discussion to maintain order in the breakout room. No worry, I'm not going to be very violent. But uh, yeah, before asking the question, this is the last one. Please state your name and the institution you're affiliated with. Okay, so if uh, Dr. Garcia is ready for the questions, we can begin. Uh, yes, Dr. Toralva, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Bivar, for acknowledging my, my um, intervention. I, as I said earlier in the breakout sessions or breakout rooms, I cannot turn on my video because of internet uh, connectivity issues. Well, first, Robin, thank you very much for that enlightening uh, lecture. You did us proud. Um, second is this. Um, I've been dealing a lot with Chinese scholars and I have been reading a lot about their initiatives to be really part of the global power. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but from the looks of it, China is really posing to be an influencer in the world, but from a cultural perspective, not from a milit militaristic perspective. Because I have seen their initiatives in the Confucian Institute. They're setting up all around the world. In the kind of um, in the kind of conferences that they organize, it's always about of values. And in my last trips to, to, to China, some sinologists were telling me that there is, of course, I can understand those characters said that there are some, those posters that you see around are Confucian values that the present administration would like their citizens to imbibe and revive. Is this, are these observations Objective, can you comment on it, please? Thank you, Dr. Turalba. Um, yes, it's true that um, China is, is, uh, has always been actually um, influenced by Confucian ideas. A lot of Northern East Asian countries, um, of course, everyone knows, um, are, are uh, really Confucian. Um, as to whether the Confucius Institutes are being used for political tools. Um, that wasn't the question, but I'd like to, to address that. Um, I don't think so. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of language, um, com really cultural component to it. I, I feel that to be able to promote more understanding in the world, we have to understand the language of other people um, to, to get, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to uh, induce cooperation among societies and understanding and pursue solidarity across um, ethnic and national uh, divides. So, um, but at the same time, I, I'd also like to say that uh, Confucian ideas, yes, it does promote uh, personal values, how to conduct yourself in society to, towards your family and towards uh, many different aspects of uh, uh, you as an individual, how you interact with social units. I, I'd say that overall, Confucian ideas are actually quite peaceful um, as what might be um, described by other countries. 
Of course, um, Confucian ideas are not the only ideas that are promoted by China. There are a lot of ideas promoted by China. There are a lot of philosophers actually in China, Chinese philosophy um, also um, welcome other ideas. Some are not so peaceful. Actually, some of them, like for example, uh, Sun Tzu, <laughs> The Art of War, right? So that's a very influential text as well. But Confucius ideas promote peace. I think it's a good thing. Um, and yes, uh, because it promotes peace, I think that's what China uh, prioritizes as a front towards cultural understanding and um, cooperation. I, I hope I was able to uh, comment properly on the, uh, on the question. Yes, thank you very much, Robin, for that insight. Thank you, Dr. Teralba. Very good. And uh, I'd like to add that uh, I think um, that's also a thing of uh, all first world countries. You know, they have, uh, as, as Romo Ramon has said here in the, in the chat box, there are uh, a lot of free Mandarin lessons on the internet. And the same thing can be said of other countries, right? I think, um, personally, I think it's just a way of, you know, communicating themselves, making themselves more understood. Um, so it's really up to it's really up to the to the readers. It's really up to the people to to accept it or or not. Well, that's from a linguist, not from a political economy uh, perspective. <laughs> okay, uh, we'd like to ask the next question if there's any. Okay, uh, Rayhan. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Rayhan. I am an alumni of Vidya Mandela uh, Faculty of Philosophy. And my question is, uh, I'm not too familiar with uh, international relations. So my question would be, how does an international relation uh, view uh, or interpret military presence? When, does, uh, when, do, when can we interpret it as a, a defensive present? And when can we say that it's a threatening present? Because as we see, uh, sometimes it's kind of blurry. Like uh, the, uh, the presence of China in the South China Sea, we can say oh, it's, it, they're defending themselves. Now, when do we say that it's threatening and when do we say it's defensive? Thank you. That's an excellent question. And actually at the center of debates of international relations, there's a phenomenon called the security dilemma where both countries are, they simply want to defend their own borders, but it's interpreted by the other country as threatening and therefore they end up going to war with each other. So that's a security dilemma because as you want to secure your border by putting up uh, um, you know, more military establishments, by beefing up your, your defensive systems, even if you don't really want to attack another country, you really just want to protect your people, that's viewed by the others as, as an affront or as an attack to them. So that's a good question because it really is blurry and countries do go to war because of that blurry line. But what I say is that um, you can prevent conflict by a mechanism called reassurance. It's more than diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy is talking, but reassurance is really signaling your intentions to another country that even if you're doing these defensive tactics, you really want to cooperate with them. One of the biggest examples of um, of signaling reassurance actually from China is the Belt and Road Initiative. It's saying that, you know, we really don't want any trouble. We want to cooperate with you. In fact, that's why we're investing in your country. So, of course, there's, there are mixed views. Some people think that it's, the, it's really a, 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 a more pessimistic view that people, China really wants to pursue the debt trap, right, to trap countries into paying them more money. But there's another view, which is that China has pure intentions and that it really just wants to help. Um, of course, you have the South China Sea. Uh, that's always been a big issue. I don't want to get into that. But what I'd say is this. Um, there are things that um, China believes are its core interests. And I think even if you have conflict of interests as, as with territory, it's still possible to resolve it peacefully if you want to. Right and, and, and an understanding can be reached. Um, but of course, there's a lot of, of factors in it, like nationalism, patriotism, ownership, sovereignty. Those issues are emotional issues, I, I understand. But at the same time, we have to understand what are the intentions of countries. So, so to answer your question, how do we spot the difference between an offensive or a defensive action? You have to understand the intention of the country in doing what it's doing. 
So it's really more understanding, putting yourself in the shoes of the other country or, or the other uh, uh, state or the other leader. Thank you. Sorry, I've been muted. Uh, very good, Rehan. Uh, would you like to ask another question or? Uh, uh, thank you. Me. Yeah, I think that's enough. Very good, very good. Anyone else who can uh, would like to contribute to the discussion? Yeah, I'd like Dr. to add something. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Nadres, please. Yes, well, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation and thank you for saying yes to our invitation. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know if I am in a information bubble when I watch uh, YouTube, <laughs> but uh, there are two things. First is that the last thing that we watched in order to understand what was happening in Sri Lanka, they I think it was DW, but anyway, uh, they were analyzing the reasons why Sri Lanka got into a, a financial economic crisis, and one of the reasons was China. Because, uh, I don't know, they got them into debt and now they can't pay them or something like that. So I, I'd like to know your opinion about that. And if it's really, China is really of good intentions, then uh, are they saying, what is what they're saying correct? That actually China caused them to fall just like that. Second is, well, even before that, uh, some of the videos that I watched uh, is about the issue of Taiwan. So I would understand perfectly. I, I know that China thinks Taiwan is part of China. So I mean, I mean, he they always say that. Uh, so what is the truth there? Um, will we will we just say okay, China is just trying to protect this territory, <laughs> it's trying to regain ground that really belongs to it, etc. Because actually, with the I think the the leader of China did say publicly that they were going to get Taiwan. So, and then Australia is reacting and thinking that it will, it will, uh, it will destroy the, uh, the balance of the balance there in, in this area and there everybody's going to get involved, etc. cetera. So um, what do you think of that? How would you interpret that? Uh, is it just a wrong interpretation of what's happening? Uh, maybe the third idea is that when the Ukraine, uh, when the war, so I say, war in Ukraine started, uh, one of the commentators, I think from Oxford or Harvard, he said, actually, if something happens in in China, China against it, that will be bigger than the one in Ukraine. So more people, more countries will be involved. So maybe comments on those three things that you see there that are opinions of people about this relationship in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadres. Of course, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, those, those are all very um, complicated questions, to be honest. Um, regarding Sri Lanka, I know that there was a port um, that was um, essentially now owned by China because uh, Sri Lanka was not able to pay back uh, China for the debt. Um, but you know, uh, what I say is that all debts have conditions. World Bank, IMF, ADB, USA, all these have conditions. And some of these conditions differ from each country to country. You have JICA, you have Austin, right? Um, so for example, uh, for, for USA, a lot of it is tied with human rights and uh, political democracy, that they will only give you aid once you perform or you know, uh, once you have set certain standards to achieve certain values. Um, for the World Bank and ADB, perhaps the terms are more reasonable, but nonetheless, there are conditions to all of this. Uh, so what I'd say is that I cannot comment on the intention of China because maybe some of the people who dealt with Sri Lanka at that time uh, really didn't have good intentions. But what I say is countries as a whole um, do really have to, uh, to, to put some conditions because that's, uh, of course, that's your money. But these are the, the resources that they're willingly going to uh, uh, lend to, to other countries. 
So there are conditions and there will be conditions. In fact, China is not across history. In Latin America, for example, the US, the World Bank has been demonized uh, for so long. Um, the, in fact, Latin America elected uh, leaders based on their, um, their uh, uh, hatred towards the United States for the World Bank loans. Um, so that's why you have populist uh, leaders, leftist populist leaders being elected in Latin America. Um, so money and aid really, and the loans um, really do have a very important role to play when it comes to national consciousness and the way you know, uh, it's being, uh, that consciousness is being played out. There are, there are very strong social groups that try to fan the flames um, to, to um, but there are others also who have a different perspective. You know, at one point, uh, it would really require for a country to borrow in order to be productive economically. The question is from who will you borrow and by how much and what terms will you agree with? Um, so maybe, maybe the intention of China with Sri Lanka is not very, you know, very good. Um, but, um, but what we'd say is that, you know, all, all, all countries, uh, especially when it comes to money, really do uh, 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 have conditions, regardless of if it's China or the US or Aust Australia, Japan, um, even the Philippines. The second question was on, sorry, I, was able, I wasn't able to, to get sec, uh, three Taiwan. questions, right? Taiwan. Oh, Taiwan, okay. So that's another complicated issue. Um, actually, UANP hosted the, the Taiwan representative to the Philippines. Um, last year, so uh, it was uh, the ambassador, well, the representative, and actually uh, Dr. Bernie Villegas, who, who, who spoke about uh, Taiwan-Philippine relations and the relationship of Taiwan and China. Um, so, of course, we know that before the Communist Party of China in 1940s, 1949, took over China, you had the Republican Democratic China. Actually, there was a time that China was not they not led by the Communist Party. And that's the group that lost the revolution that went to Taiwan, right? So Chiang Kai-shek and Chisun Yat-sen. Um, and that's why they, they, they formed the democratic country. They did not win it in the mainland. But of course, China is saying, and the Communist Party is saying, you know, we beat you. So uh, it doesn't matter where you run. Uh, we own everything. <laughs> um, so it's a very complicated issue, actually. But what I'd say is that as long as you know, territories will always be um, issues in international relations, uh, emotional issues, because that's where you live, that's your home. Uh, but as long as you're willing to, to not be violent and be open to understanding discussion, I think that things will be resolved. Um, China has said that it, it's going to be violent towards Taiwan. Uh, we know that. But there was a time that... Um, China was actually willing to not be violent and uh, talk to the leadership in, in Taiwan. So we hope that those uh, cooler heads prevail and uh, Taiwan and you know, the regional architecture will not be as conflictual. On the third question, what was the third question? Sorry. So you think that it, China won't do anything in this area of the type of Ukraine, Eurasia? Ah. That's, that's the worry of uh, Australia. Yeah, so you... Russia-Ukraine issue, that's another complicated discussion. There are a lot of players involved. I think Russia attacked Ukraine as a reaction to both insecurity and ambition. Russia has always had this revivalist um, ambition, actually, to revive the old power of the USSR um, in the new world, in the contemporary world after the Cold War. Of course, you know that... Uh, Vladimir Putin is a product of the Cold War. He was elected in the 90s as the leader of Russia. So that's why he has this ambition to uh, go back to what he calls the glory days. But at the same time, he thinks that the U.S. is weak. And therefore, that's why uh, you know, the, the, uh, he attacked Ukraine now. Uh, in terms of insecurity, you know, the, the irony is that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was created precisely to counter Russia. Um, but at the same time, 
over the last few decades, NATO has rejected the application of Ukraine to NATO. So, and then now NATO realized that we should have already included uh, Ukraine in, in, in the NATO uh, roster of countries. Um, things could have been better. And then now because the invasion of Ukraine, if Russia is successful, will affect the other countries in the region. NATO has an interest in, has an interest in helping Ukraine. Whether China will be um, involved in this whole thing, maybe, uh, because it's a big ally of Russia. Uh, but at the same time, I think that um, China really cannot afford to go to war if it has ambitions to, to, to be economically more developed. Um, it cannot afford to go to war. Um, but at the same time, China's always said that it's not going to interfere with the, with the domestic uh, relations of uh, countries. Um, so we'll see if um, they will do another Taiwan or another West Philippine or South China Sea uh, with Ukraine, um, if it's going to ally with Russia, at least all out uh, to help uh, Russia towards Ukraine. Yeah, thank very, you. Very, very um, Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's very tough. <laughs> Hope very, I was able to answer. Yeah, very complex questions and, of course, complex answers as well. Of course, uh, not all these questions will have, uh, will have um, uh, answers, right? Um, well, just to comment, I, I like very much what you said about reassurances because, uh, yeah, so while uh, historically there are a lot of, uh, you know, pieces of evidence that, uh, that uh, China has been, you know, going to the other side of the of the, um, I mean, becoming more peaceful rather than more violent as, uh, as happened in history. Um, I just want to know how, how, um, how China has been in terms of um, honoring its words, in terms of, uh, yeah, these uh, reassurances that you mentioned. If you have any opinion or any information about it. Um, well, it's a mixed record. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, the we, we can go to the elections now. <laughs> the build, build, build program of President Duterte was really anchored on borrowing from China. Um, people have been saying that it hasn't been that successful because China really did not deliver on the investments. Um, at least that's the discourse in the domestic sphere. And that's one of the uh, criticisms against President Duterte's pivot to China, that it really didn't, you know, it wasn't really fruitful as previously thought. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are a lot of areas that China has cooperated with us. And there are some, um, some instances really that China has invested in, in the Philippines. Um, but again, we, we have to, to, to look at it from a bigger perspective. If um, what are the actual promises that, that China has with us? What is the fine print in terms of um, the, the agreement for cooperation between China and the Philippines? Uh, there are a lot of aspects, security, economics, um, culture, aid. So it's, it's not as simple as, um, I mean, it's, it's a very hard question to, to answer because we have to be comprehensive and fair uh, before we say yes or no. So I guess um, that's uh, further research that we can do, scholars can do. Um, in order to really assess uh, whether China really says what it what it uh, does what it says, but but in terms of reassurance, um, actually, trust is also very important in international relations. There's a concept called resolve. So your alliance, the the strength of your alliance and the trust between countries, will be um, strengthened if countries have resolved to cooperate, meaning uh, are really sure that they want to cooperate and they follow through. If, if they don't have resolve, um, then alliances might, um, might, uh, might, might, uh, might fall. That's one of the, the issues with the US. In fact, that um, the US alliance with Southeast Asia uh, became flimsy because uh, President Trump revised the strategy of the US towards Southeast Asia from what President Obama established when he was president. 
So, um, in, you know, in the Philippines, you have uh, agreements such as the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. You have um, the, you know, uh, many types of agreements that um, um, was, was supposed to be fulfilled, but uh, were not because it was just revised by, by, uh, by another leadership. So that really affects the resolve and the image of the US in, in the Philippines and it reduces trust. So trust, reassurance and resolve are, are concepts that, uh, that are related to each other and will always be important as we pursue a cooperation. Yeah, these are very important uh, elements because uh, as far as I can remember, reading about uh, the Ukraine and Russian conflict, um, uh, Russia had told uh, everybody that, hey, we're not going to attack. <laughs> but uh, okay, came what uh, that day, D-Day, we had this, uh, what's, on, what's going on up to, this, up to this moment. And then you mentioned something, I don't know. So while others are still thinking about questions, I, I just want to take advantage of it to, <laughs> to ask you questions as well. Um, you mentioned something about ASEAN, I mean, the role of China in, uh, in this region. Can you elaborate more on that? Because uh, well, we're, all, we're all members of the ASEAN here. You know? I mean, most of the, the majority of the participants here. So uh, maybe just a little bit about that. Actually, there's a concept called ASEAN centrality. So ASEAN centrality uh, really describes that ASEAN is at the center of many things in the Asian, East Asian region. So by East Asia, we mean Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. So Northeast Asia includes South Korea, Japan, Mongolia, China. Um, Northeast Asia does not have a similar institution such as the ASEAN. So what happens is that all these countries go to the ASEAN to discuss things. So the ASEAN plus three, um, the, the 10 ASEAN countries plus the three big countries in Northeast Asia, is, it's exactly that mechanism for, for the ASEAN to be the forum to discuss important issues in economics and security. And you have what you call the ASEAN Regional Forum where the disputes are being discussed. So when, when all these countries are, are convening the ASEAN, it's, it's a, such a very such an important event, very important event in the, the every year um, because we're closer to cooperation. Of course, you know, it breaks down. But China, speaking of China, during the 1997 financial crisis, actually China was uh, very involved in bailing out Southeast Asian countries. Um, or at least offering loans to, to beleaguered uh, Southeast Asian economies. So in, China has participated in individual ASEAN um, countries in, in terms of bilateral relations. In Indonesia, for example, we know that Indonesia, uh, Joko Widodo was, is, is a very strong advocate for trade with China, but not in security. So uh, uh, he's very firm with the South China Sea issues. Um, and so that's the concept called deep coupling. You do not mix the economics and security. It's possible to trade even if you have conflict of interest. So that's exactly what we were saying. It is possible to cooperate even if you disagree with some other things. Um, so uh, China has continually traded with the ASEAN countries uh, even if it has disputes with a lot of the maritime Southeast Asian countries, not just the Philippines and Indonesia, but the Vietnam, Brunei, who have claims to the South China Sea. So it's possible to cooperate. And the record of cooperation of China really is in economics um, and uh, in, in, in the territorial disputes as well. China has, um, uh, has, been in, has participated in the calls for the code of conduct. But of course, it's been trying to stall the code of conduct uh, in the South China Sea, but um, you know, at least China is um, uh, you know open to talking as long as, of course, the the terms that it wants uh, will be met. But you know, in terms of economics, China is a big investor, and the countries have been welcoming uh, that investment and in economic activity from China.
Thanks very much. That's very enlightening. I think there's another uh, another one who wants to ask a question. Rehan? May I ask a question again? Please. Since we've been talking about reassurance and trait, uh, it pops up to me a question. Would the empirical fact that China has been peaceful all, all this time change if Taiwan does not have their silicon dome? As we know, Taiwan is a great manufacturer of uh, silicon chips for computers all over I mean, the world. They are one of the biggest. And I think that's one of their power, their strength, that if something happened to Taiwan, the whole world economy could be uh, disrupted. Uh, would it be a different case if Taiwan does not have their uh, manufacture, uh, their silicon manufacturing facilities? Because as we see, uh, Russia and Europe has this North 2 gas line before they invade. And once they are finished, Russia was brave enough to make the move to invade Ukraine since they know they have this uh, economic importance to Europe. Uh, would it be the same case with Taiwan and China? Um, to answer your question, the answer is yes, it will be different if Taiwan was not the center for semiconductor manufacturing for all the cell phones, the laptops, and the, the, the whole tech system of the world. It's really based in, in Taiwan. So you have uh, brands such as Acer, such as um, you know, many big brands coming up from Taiwan, but it's also at the back end, a manufacturer of chips. So that's a very good point. It will be different, definitely. Taiwan will be in a weaker spot and to lose it, um, it's less in its leverage, um, you know, in the world if it does not have that um, economic leverage. Um, so it's yeah, you're right. Similar to the oil, <laughs> um, the 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 petrol resources of of um, of Russia um, and other countries that really lead to to their leverage and give them um, more upper hand in terms of negotiations. Um, so yeah, China does need Taiwan in a sense, and that's why Taiwan has been, you know, has has had a an opportunity to really stand up to to China in many aspects. So um, yeah, the answer is yes. Very good. Um, well, I see another question. Uh, this is from okay, two questions. Maybe I'll uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to um, to Phil Safat. That's uh, Mr. Simon, Simon Huntara. Yeah, Mr. Simon, please. Go ahead, you're muted. Mr. Simon, you're, you're muted, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Robin Michael Garcia. It, uh, your presentation is very excellent and for me it's, it's very, very interesting. And it raises a, a, a question and I, I need an, uh, your opinion about this when we are talking. Uh, maybe it's not about the uh, politics, yeah, but about uh, solidarity. For me, that's very interesting. When we are talking about uh, solidarity, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, but if we agree about cultural and maybe informational and economical invasion to reach solidarity, it is I try to uh, to understand uh, your presentation. Yeah. Um, though uh, actually we know that all health in economical and cultural context uh, actually is re always related to uh, how a country or a nation state will always uh, try to gain something from another country in the later time yeah, after they help because of their solidarity. Uh, I think we have a problem about uh, identity. I mean that uh, global solidarity is uh, uh, potentially erasing a local identity because uh, uh, I think in a globalized world, it is unavoidable, yeah. And it will be a big problem culturally. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, when we are talking about uh, solidarity in uh, based on uh, religion, for example, in Indonesia, maybe 
uh, we can say that uh, it is solidarity based on Islam or based on uh, Christianity. Uh, sometimes uh, we are accused to be, oh, well, it is a, a process to make them Christian or to make them Muslim. Um, I think it will happen also when we are talking about the solidarity from um, from Chinese, yeah. Uh, because I think uh, they are not trying to make a military invasion, but culturally invasion. Uh, what do you think of, or what's your opinion about this? Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Thank you very much. It's a good question because as the world opened up, you know, there's always a threat for um, liberal and global ideas to, to be more dominant than the local culture. In fact, one very important political scientist argued that the next war will not be about communism or, or democracy, will not be about economics, it will about, be, be about civilizations. So the clash of civilizations by Professor Samuel Huntington is argued precisely that. Because as we opened up the world, as the, the dominant liberal global democratic ideas became, became dominant, there will be some pushback from indigenous peoples, from non-democratic and you know, more Islamic in the, I mean, countries that have different ideas from the West. So the McDonaldization, the Westernization of the world has always been a threat. But what I say is this, um, there, will, there will not be cultural hegemony of Western ideas. I think that a lot of countries will uh, um, uh, marry global ideas with local ideas. So that means that there will be a cultural integration rather than a replacement of local cultures and local ideas. Um, so instead of uh, completely replacing ideas that are at the, at the local level, for global ideas to be successful in the local sphere, they have to be accepted and fit into local um, nuance, uh, nuances, uh, cultural nuances. Um, so I actually do research on global norms. So I don't just do research on security, but I always look at the perspective of global norms and how it is accepted or rejected in the local sphere. So uh, what in my research, I've always seen that Global norms have always been mixed with local norms. So I don't think there will be a, a, a replacement altogether. Um, I think it will be integrated and mixed. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Yeah, very good. Very good question. Um, yeah, maybe we can ask the last question so that uh, we can go back to, no, before go. Yeah, we're already in the main room. Yeah. So, um, I mean, people are people are hungry already. It's already um, two o'clock here in the Philippines. But uh, let's ask the last question. I think uh, Dr. Nadres has, has it. Please. Yeah, continue. sorry for asking again. <laughs> it's just that when you were talking about the ASEAN, uh, it something came to my mind that that thing that uh, Zelensky was saying to the UN Peace Council that he was saying that I mean you are supposed to uphold peace. And if you cannot do it, then what are you there for? You better dissolve yourselves. So, <laughs> I mean, you're just a group of people there meeting and nothing is happening. So, uh, is that true? And what about the ASEAN? Will uh, it go the same way or something like that? Uh, Dr. Question. Nadres, that's actually a wonderful question because that's at the core of the debates in international relations theory, whether or not global institutions have any role at all in promoting peace, in, 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 you know, in promoting uh, uh, cooperation in the world. Does it even matter to have institutions? Because if it, you cannot achieve 
uh, as Zelensky and completely agree, then understand where the, he's coming from, then, you know, it's useless. You know, I actually wrote a, an article 2018. I, the question that I asked is, is the, ASEAN, uh, is the ASEAN chairman, so we have a rotating chairmanship every year, is the ASEAN chairman just a glorified events organizer? <laughs> Do you really just, you know, you, you organize events and you hold forums, but is that the only thing that you do? Um, and a lot of people are saying that the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council is just a big debating society, that they just, you know, uh, go there, wear suits and wear a tie, you know, wear ties and maybe three-piece suits and, and you know, sound smart and they end there. <laughs> and they, they, they deliver fiery speeches. I have a different perspective, though. Um, I would say that global uh, institutions, international organizations, even if they have, um, they do not have a direct power of enforcement, what they do, the benefit to us is they facilitate dialogue, they set the rules and, and unify the expectations for everyone. So that matters. It defines what's right and wrong. It tells us whether we can do certain things and therefore it's up to you if you eventually do it or not. So the punitive mechanisms of global organizations may not exactly be um, as strong, but it does facilitate understanding. It gives you reassurance about the intentions of other countries. So it is useful. The ASEAN is weaker than the EU. Um, but I think the ASEAN as an institution cannot be judged the same way uh, as how the European Union works. Um, Europe has very different um, uh, history from, from, uh, from ASEAN. I think the biggest one is how Europe, European countries was actually willing to give up some sovereignty for this institution, uh, such as the European Commission. The ASEAN, I think we're not yet there because we don't have a strong, a, a big history of um, huge conflicts among each other. So there's no urgency for us to, you know, uh, let's just let another entity decide. Uh, but at the same time, one of the, re one of the benefits of the ASEAN is it did facilitate dialogue, as I said, uh, it, it, it is central in the dialogues in East Asia. Um, there are a lot of things resolved at the ASEAN level. Um, the fact that a lot of countries are willing to go every year and discuss things at the finance, economics, security, culture, um, is a very big thing. Um, multilateral agreements are being made at the ASEAN level. The biggest trading block right now, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, is an ASEAN-led economic partnership. It is now bigger than the APEC actually. And the RCEP uh, was joined by China because China understands the benefit of the RCEP. So it's very recent, actually just a few months ago, that the RCEP was uh, ratified by all the countries involved. So while global institutions, uh, multilateral uh, institutions do not have the power as we expected, they do have a lot of benefit. Uh, hopefully, I was able to answer your question. Yeah, I just realized that one of the very basic things it's it's educational, so it lets us all be aware of what we have to achieve. Even though the organization itself can't do it by itself, but at least we're all very aware of what we have to achieve. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. That's a, a very good way to, uh, to end the discussion. So the role of uh, ASEAN <laughs> in, the, in this region, I think it's really for solidarity, right? So if you look at the, M, uh, at the logo of the ASEAN, it's uh, what, stocks of rice bound together, okay, unity. Uh, at this point, I'd like to call on Dr. Nandres for the um, awarding of the plaque of appreciation and uh, photo ops afterwards. Dr. Nadres? It's a certificate of appreciation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rowan Michael Garcia, for having graced our occasion and given us so much enlightenment about this. And well, uh, the Global Solidarity Crisis Symposium 
2022 awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Robin Michael Garcia for his invaluable service uh, in as plenary speaker through the presentation of his paper here on China. Um, this is signed by Mr. Antara Simon and Dr. Ramon Lakes. Thank you very much. Hand of the big round of applause for I'll, I'll turn the floor to the MCs. Thank you, Dr. Robin Michael Garcia, for the presentation. And thank you, Dr. Arwin Fibar, for moderating this session. Uh, let us now proceed to take pictures. Please turn on and look at your camera for about 15 seconds while our technical team work on taking the picture. Is the technical team done with taking the pictures? Okay. We will now have the time to take a lunch break. This session will resume in one hour with Professor Dr. Franz Manis Suseno SJ as our plenary speaker. It will begin at 1415 Western Indonesia time, 1515 Philippine time, 915 Central European summer time and 12.45 Indian Standard Time. The Zoom meeting will remain open throughout the lunch break. We will be sharing some videos. So ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome to remain if you like. Thank you, Robin. See you, hope to see you in the Philippines. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.